How many have ever seen a fossil? I happen to have one here that's not exactly the best fossil in the world, but somebody gave it to me. But paleontology is the study of fossils. What exactly are fossils? Fossils are the remains or traces of plants and animals in the Earth's crust. Literally billions of fossils have been discovered. Usually they're located in sedimentary rock, and sedimentary rock, if you recall, is the rock that's laid down by water. Fossils give us a record of what things look like in past times, and it shows that they're very much like things today, and of course there are some fossils of some extinct animals. There are fossils like of plants and animals. They even consider a footprint a fossil. Here are some what is thought to be dinosaur fossils. I happened to, about a year and a half ago, be able to go in, in the Denver area where there's a, a ridge where I saw some what they felt are dinosaur fossils. How are fossils formed? Well, most fossils are not footprints or like plants, animals, and so forth. We feel like fossils are formed by floods, and they usually come without warning and the weight of the sediment in the water carries something very quickly, it just remains together. Most fossils, as I mentioned, were formed by the flood. We, who are creationists, believe that that flood was the worldwide flood that occurred in Genesis, which we call Noah's flood. And we believe that animals and plants were all living together rather than at separate geologic ages. For example, evolutionists will have like the age of reptiles and the age of mammals. If you are driving this afternoon and you hit a squirrel or a rabbit, don't expect the next day to find a fossil of that squirrel or rabbit. What's going to happen? Bacteria starts setting in and decaying and it's very possible some crow or vulture or something like that will start eating the flesh off of it. So normal death does not produce fossils. Now for the carcass to be preserved as a fossil, it's going to be buried deep enough so that the scavengers can't get at it has to be deep enough also so that the oxygen and bacteria can't get at it at least as fast. And so it has to be buried rapidly. And we think that during the flood, this rapid burial and covering the fossils is what caused it. Why are fossils really important? Fossils provide the only available records of plants and animals in time past. I guess I have to qualify the only available. Obviously, if there's some historical records, like I think that God, through Job, described the behemoth. So some historical records would give us some idea. But normally, to know for sure what animals looked like in the past, if we have a fossil of it, we can get a very good idea. So the reason it's so important in the creation evolution issue is it's really the only direct evidence for or against evolution. Now let's see what we can learn from fossils. Well, what we can tell is usually the hard parts. You can tell how big the bones are. You can tell how many teeth it has lots of times if they're all together. You can tell something about the shape of the shells, for example, the clam. So hard parts, yes. But there are some things you cannot tell from the fossil record. You really cannot tell just from the fossil record whether it's cold-blooded or warm-blooded. And you cannot tell the shapes of the soft parts, like the nose, the lips, the ears, the eyes, the hair. You won't be able to tell what color the skin is, because these soft parts, like skin and hair and lips and eyes, eventually rot away. So when you see a reconstruction, like for example the museum, that's often the figment of man's imagination. It, and he looks at it from a biased idea. So if he has in mind evolutionary theory, then he's going to try to reconstruct these soft parts to look like he wants them to look like. So I, I really should qualify what I said because if they're frozen rather than the normal fossilization and sealed by ice, 
then, then sometimes the hair will be preserved. In fact, they've even found sometimes in the stomachs what they've eaten. So I should qualify that a frozen specimen is different than one that's buried by rock. I would place also the Ice Age after the flood. Now, why is the fossil record an embarrassment to evolutionists? And if evolution was true, we should find transitional forms. If one species evolved to another, then something in between, which is called a transitional form or intermediate form, should be available in the fossil record. But we don't find it. Instead, the fossil record is really a record of mass destruction, death, burial by water, and of course covered by sediments. So if anything, the fossil record really confirms the biblical record and certainly not the evolutionary idea that things evolve from one form to another. For example, from the beginning, what evolutionists would say that life evolved from single-celled organisms to really these what are called invertebrates. And when you look at these fossils in for what evolutionists even think is the earliest period, the Cambrian period, fossils like these trilobites, they are very complex. Their eyes are complex. If there's no intermediate between these complex invertebrates. In fact, even in the geologic record, Cambrian explosion because all of a sudden in the rock, according to them, they, they come up with these complex creatures with nothing in what they call the pre-Cambrian period. And then a more familiar scene is in the evolutionary pattern, they would feel that fish evolved into amphibians, and I have an example here of a fish picture here and also an amphibian like a frog. Now if the fin of the fish is supposed to evolve into the leg of the amphibian, there ought to be some immediate between the fin and the foot. Quarter uh, foot, three quarter fin or half foot. But you don't you see things with fins, you see things with feet and you don't see anything in between. And if evolution was true, you'd see a gradual transitional forms. I might just mention, there is a basic difference between fish and amphibians or reptiles. For example, in fish, what we call the pelvic bones, they're very small and they're just loosely embedded in the muscle. There's no connection between the pelvic bones and the spine or the vertebrae. But in amphibians, your pelvic bones are very large, they're firmly attached to the spinal column, and this is necessary in order for the creature to walk. So there's a big difference just in the bone structure, and it's necessary, of course, for amphibians to have a different bone structure in order to walk. Now another thing that we would be familiar, of course, is mammals and reptiles. The, the evolutionary theory has it that reptiles evolved into mammals. This is kind of interesting. Now, do any of you know how many bones are in the lower jaw of a reptile? I think you're aware they have many bones that a snake can swallow something very large. So if reptiles with six bones in the lower jaw, why isn't there something in the fossil record that has five bones or four bones, three bones or two bones in the lower jaw. Also, reptiles have one bone in their ear, whereas mammal with three bones in your ear. Common name is the hammer, the stirrup, and the anvil in your ear. A reptile has one. Well, if a reptile with one bone evolved into a mammal with three bones, there ought to be something in the fossil record that has two bones, and it's not there. And then, of course, a mammal nurses its young through mammary glands. That's where the name mammal from system, where reptiles don't. Reptiles' temperature takes the temperature of the surroundings. When it gets here 10 below zero in January, what will your body temperature be? Not 10 below. Hopefully, it'll be still 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Because regulatory system, your brain tells your system to start burning food, burning calories to keep you warm. On the other hand, if it's 110 degrees, your body temperature still stays 98.6. The brain tells your body to start perspiring. The perspiration evaporates, cools it down, 
Very marvelous system. Reptiles don't have that. Mammals have hair, reptiles don't. And our breathing system is different. We have a diaphragm, reptiles have no diaphragm. So a big difference that if one was devolved to another, there should have been transitional forms. So you can see how the fossil record confirms the idea of kind, the you know, separate creatures designed by God. We could talk about the origin of flight. For example, on the left you have the flying reptiles, which are extinct. You have the birds, you have the mammals. There's few mammals that fly. What is that that's going back and forth? A bat nurses its young. It's not a bird, it's a mammal. And then of course flies, mosquitoes, and those sort of the insects. So you have you really have four different categories. If evolution was true, you'd have had to have the evolution of flight in four different categories. And there's a huge difference between a flying creature and a non-flying. For an animal to fly, their bone structure has to be very light. The bones are hollow, and their flight muscles, the muscles to make their wings move, have to be very strong. Also, if evolution was true, and a reptile had to develop wings, say it had a half wing, that would be of no use to it. It would be a hindrance for it to compete with the other reptiles designed for life on the ground. So really, when you think of it, the reptile, the jaw is different. The reptile jaw to evolve into a bird would have to evolve into a toothless beak. What the animal would be eating, what it chewed, would be a real mystery. So really, the evolutionary scenario is an absurdity. Now, the gaps in the fossil record are a real embarrassment to evolutionists. Creatures appear in the rocks fully formed, without any evidence of step-by-step -step change. But it's been over 140 years since he wrote his book. I've got on the slide millions of fossils. Really, I should have billions of fossils have been uncovered. But there's still no evidence of a gradual change from simpler to more complex animals. So in actuality, the fossil record is against the Darwinian theory of evolution. And it is interesting that his strongest opponents were the paleontologists, the fossil experts. It, were not, it was not the theologians. The theologians came in and developed their compromise theory. I like cartoons. This is BC, but Johnny Hart was kind enough to let me use this. This guy's got there digging. He's digging, he gets underground. He hollers out, Eureka! What have you found? The missing links. Well, that's a different kind of missing link than the evolutionists are looking for. You probably have heard about Archaeopteryx. Evolutionists claim that Archaeopteryx was an intermediate between reptiles and birds. This creature from the fossil record had a flight type wing, avian wing. It had feathers, it had perching feet, it had a wishbone. These are certainly bird-like features. But it is also true that it had some reptilian features. For example, it had claws on the wings, teeth, and a long tail. And so they used this as evidence that a reptile evolved into a bird. Here's a picture of a fossil of Archaeopteryx. And a tail, feathers, legs here. Most of the time you don't find a complete fossil, you know, a complete structure. You, this is a fairly complete. It doesn't have a, a lot of details, but it was, they've surmised that it had these qualities. Now how do we answer that? What about Archaeopteryx? Let's get some facts. Remember one of the things it said it had claws on its wings. Some birds today have claws on their wings. That isn't necessarily just evidence of a reptile. The fact that it had some teeth 
that also doesn't indicate that our teeth or not no teeth doesn't indicate whether a species is a reptile or not because some reptiles do not have teeth. Also, another real problem for evolutionists is in the same rock layers they found modern birds. Well, if Archaeopteryx was supposed to have been like 75 million years earlier, the layers that evolutionists claim 75 million years earlier than Archaeopteryx, they find birds. Well, how could birds be in an older layer rock? So let me make some conclusions regarding Archaeopteryx. The teeth of the Archaeopteryx were distinctly different from those of reptiles. All the features of Archaeopteryx were fully formed, fully functional. There were not half scales and half feathers, or half legs and half wings. One of the greatest arguments against evolution is that an animal could not have survived with only partially developed structures. Thus, Archaeopteryx was a 100% bird and not a reptile bird transition. It is simply another extinct bird that had teeth. The fossils say no to evolution. The fossil record is against the Darwinian theory of evolution.